Welcome to Adult Bible Study with Bill. Our scripture readings for this lesson come from the book of Genesis. Most of you know that Genesis is the first book of the Bible. I imagine most of you know the opening words of Genesis, in the beginning. But did you know that Genesis is the Hebrew word for in the beginning? Most scholars acknowledge that the first five books of the Bible were written from two points of view. One point of view was the priestly tradition, which was preceded by the Jawist tradition 400 years earlier. The priestly portions of Genesis can be seen as stately, rhythmical, and dignified, similar to a liturgy in a wit worship service. They present an optimistic view of humanity. In contrast, the Jawist portions are emotional and present a more negative view of humanity. The fact that both traditions appear in the Bible demonstrates that God's truth cannot be defined within a single human point of view. Today's scripture reading consists of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 31, chapter 2 verses 4 through 8, and verses 15 through 20. These contain two accounts of creation that deal with the creation of mankind. So let's find out how these two accounts compare as we listen to this audio recording from the Common English Bible. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image, to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. Then God said, I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield seeds and all the trees whose fruit produces its seeds within it. These will be your food. To all wildlife, to all the birds of the sky, and to everything crawling on the ground, to everything that breathes, I give all the green grasses for food. And that's what happened. God saw everything he had made. It was supremely good. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth, and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land, and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, Eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. While there are differences in timeline and emphasis on certain points of the creation narrative, other issues have captured the attention of theologians. Theologians have for centuries wrestled over the meaning of the word image. In Genesis 1 verse 27, God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them, male and female. God created them. Does image mean an exact copy, a photograph, a reflection in a mirror, or a graphics file on your computer screen? All of these are images. 
A mere physical similarity doesn't explain all of it. How could a physical body even contain all that is God? So theologians have suggested that instead God's image relates to the characteristics and purpose God gave to humanity. One of the many ways that theologians propose humanity reflects God's image is as a being who, alone among all the creatures of the earth, have the ability to create. Terence E. Fredheim wrote, Human beings are not only created in the image of God, that is, who they are in the world, they are also created to be the image of God, that is, their role in the world. The work that God gave us, caring for and enhancing the earth, is also the same work that God continues to do in creation. Our work and God's work are both integral to the continued success of creation. Sue Mink, the author of our Bible study, tells us, and I quote, Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 reads, The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and take care of it. Immediately after God created the human, God gave him a job. Coming right on the heels of creation, this verse describes how the work of human beings is in a way for people to join in the design and formation of the world with God. Eden was not finished as God presented it to Adam. God gave the land to Adam with instructions to develop it and make it produce, entrusting humanity with the ability to transform the earth in a way that would benefit all of society through work. Incredibly, God entered a partnership with Adam to share in the process of earth's growth and change." Unquote. Adam and Eve were farmers. Does this mean that the only task for which God created us is farms, farming? Obviously not. Jesus' father Joseph was a carpenter, not a farmer. In this video clip from Cokesbury, Reverend Mark Price acknowledges the impact the traditions of farming had on the American church. He also talks about the impact other op occupations can have on our faith. My maternal grandfather was a farmer. Perhaps you were a farmer or your ancestors were farmers. Farmers still carry on the vital work of bringing food from the soil, yet they work very hard to do so. It is not unusual for farmers to work 16-hour days, and they seem never to have a day off. Historians who study American Christianity tell us that the tradition of having church worship on Sunday at 11 came from the days when America was largely an agrarian society. Farmers could finish most of the necessary work by 11 a.m. Those of us who are not farmers are still affected by the curses in Genesis 3. God punished the humans by sending them out of the Garden of Eden. And we who do not work the land ourselves are already that much more separated from the soil. All you must do is look at the weeds in my flower bed to see that I'm not accustomed to tending to the soil. So, what should we do? Should we all become farmers? While farming is a necessary work that is closely related to our original task in Genesis 2.15, the way back to God is not by everyone becoming a farmer. What we should do is glorify God and enjoy God forever. God is the great gardener who cares for the garden and all of the creation. We still have an opportunity and an obligation to be caretakers of the creation with God. Wherever we work, whatever our occupation or vocation, we still depend on the land to bring forth food. Some of our work, however, has become toil. Some of you might be working in a job you feel is more toilsome than rewarding. You might find yourself living for the weekend or counting down the days, weeks, months, and years until retirement. A church member was let go from her job. She grieved at first, but later she told me it was the best thing that had ever happened to her. She discovered that her job didn't define her. She pursued a new career path that was more fulfilling. No matter your circumstances or opportunities, remember that you are not created for your work. 
You are created to be among the human beings who are made in God's image, to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. From the beginning of time, God tasked humanity to join with God in building new things, a task that is unique in all of creation. In Isaiah chapter 43, 19, we read, Look, I am doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? God is challenging us to do new things as well. How do our jobs, our careers, our occupation meet God's challenge? How is the relationship that humanity has with God enhanced by work? I will conclude this lesson by attempting to answer these two questions. Let's consider what, for many of us, can be the start of a normal day. We wake up thinking our work is frustrating and meaningless. I'm just a tiny cog in an immense wheel. But let's change that thinking. Actors are very familiar with the quote, there are no small parts, only small actors. Now I'll admit, finding a fulfilling purpose in our work can sometimes seem hopelessly idealistic, or perhaps even a bit elitist, when our job's sole purpose comes down to paying bills. But recall that first job God gave to Adam, farming and stoop labor. As menial as it was, it was also a partnership with God. Even that work improved the part of the world for a time, until that unfortunate episode with the apple. Fast forward to today. We should continually assess the results of our work. Are we able to use our talents, creative energy, and time to make a positive impact in the world? Would God be pleased with our efforts? The writer of Ecclesiastes said that work was merely chasing after the wind. But if work is a true partnership with God and a response to guidance by God's Holy Spirit, we can participate in bringing images of God's kingdom to earth. End of comment and end of lesson. The scripture for next week's lesson is Exodus chapter 35, verse 30, through chapter 36, verse 7. In this lesson, we will explore the intersection of work, service, and worship. Stay safe and see you next week.